respect it, I mean We network across the globe Cause it's a global market in case you didn't know And since we all about information flow Let me be the first one to welcome you to Tech Zone With Paul Amadeus Lane Let's talk tech cause technology changing the game It's all good in the hood, it's everywhere Now let's get to the show cause we live on air, yeah Welcome back, Tech Zone Our second segment Paul Amadeus Lane, czar of technology. Sean, it kind of sticks now. That's why we put it on our lower third for the show. Those of you watching on video right now, you can definitely uh, check it out. If you're listening on radio, you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's why you have to go check out the video podcast. Go to the uh, YouTube page, Paul Amadeus Lane. Or the easiest way that you can connect with me, social media and everything, go to the website, paulonwheels.com. We talked about it in the beginning of the show. We talked about diversity in tech. And my next guest, you are definitely, definitely going to love. I mean, she is a person that has overcome tragedy uh, to get to where she is today. She's covering tech in Silicon Valley. She can uh, speak about, if you're interested in, in having a startup, how to, how to talk to venture capitalists. And, and all the, the nuts and bolts. So enough of me talking. I am so happy to have with me right now. I, I tell you, this woman right here is amazing in the tech field. Startups, you name it. She's a tech editor, Silicon Valley for Black Enterprise. She joins me now, Sequoia Blodgett. Hey, Sequoia, how you doing, my dear? Hi, thank you for having me. Sequoia, it is an honor to have you on. Been checking out some of the things that you've been doing and and things you've been doing throughout your career. All I want to say is you are amazing at what you do and, and just the journey that, that, that where you're at right now and, and where it started and, and following your story and, and how, how a tragic situation kind of led you down, I guess, a path that, that, that you probably didn't know you were going to be led down, right? <laughs> yeah. So if so, you could, so you could do me a favor. Why don't you, for our audience out there, why don't you, Kind of explain, uh, you know, what happened to you and and uh, how it led you down this path. Yeah, so I had a career as a commercial and music video director, and I was shooting a lot of jobs, like a lot, um, for everybody from like Diggy Simmons to Justin Bieber to a lot of like kid artists. And I moved to Atlanta in 2010 because I knew it was like a completely open market, and I was like, okay, I can populate this market and like penetrate. And then in 2013, I was like, all right, can't be here for too much longer. I felt like it was a little underdeveloped at that time. So I went back to Los Angeles, which is where I originally moved from, and started directing again there. And about, I would say, March of 2013, when I moved back, I ended up getting really sick. So it started as like a common cold where it was just like me like sneezing and stuff, right? And then I started noticing that my body was going numb and it was like, not even just like fingertips or like toes or anything. It was like my entire body. So it's like that feeling when you go to the dentist and they inject the numbing, you know, medicine to your tooth. Absolutely. Imagine that being like your entire body. So I remember going to my roommate at the time and I was like, yo, something is wrong. And she's like, no, no, no. I think you're panicking. Like, I think you're like over exaggerating. I'm like, no, no, no. I need to go to the ER. <laughs> so I ended up going to the ER in Los Angeles, which if anybody has ever been to the ER in Los Angeles, <laughs> is like a nightmare in itself. Absolutely. <laughs> There's so many people. So they were just like, you know, normally you wait and it takes like hours. But when I got there, they were like, put her in right away. And literally, like, we ran tests, neurologists came, I had MRIs taken, spinal, like, everything that you could possibly think of, and they could not figure out what was wrong, like, whatsoever. So at that point, I started reflecting. I was literally in the hospital bed, still reflecting and still working, which is odd. Like, I'm always working, which is, maybe I'm a workaholic, but that's another day for sure, right? <laughs> But, um, and I started thinking to myself, like, if this was it, because like, that's where my mind was, what did I accomplish what I wanted to accomplish while I was here? And internally, I was like, I made pretty pictures, but like, what is that really doing? Like, how does that helping people? What does that really say? 
So once they, I, I was in the hospital for about a week, a week and a half. And eventually they were like, okay, you have transverse myelitis, which is one in a million people get mm -hmm. it. No, no, one to three out of a million people get it. And I'm like, okay, those odds are insane. And you were like, how in the world did I get it, right? <laughs> I'm like, I need to be playing a lotto if that's the type of odds I have. Tell me about it. <laughs> so basically they were like, it should cure itself. Like, don't worry about it. But they put me on a bunch of medication. And they're like, you know, just like go home. And so at that point I was like, okay, well, after having that reflection, I called a friend of mine and I was like, listen, like, I really want to start this company. And he was like, well, tell me more. Like, what is it that you're looking to start? I was like, I love the fact that I create content, but I want to help people like beyond just creating content. So I started doing some research and I came across this program called Draper University, which was this insane crazy billionaire venture capitalist named tim draper who just had no cares in the world and just was free-spirited and very unorthodox in his thinking and i was like hmm let me let me look into that because i feel <laughs> like our personalities kind of connect so i looked into it and i ended up getting admitted into the program and while i was in the program i hustled so hard like I didn't know anything about entrepreneurship in the tech space. I didn't know about raising venture capital. I didn't know like anything. I was super green. And all of my peers were like students who had come from like maybe Stanford or maybe like had family who were entrepreneurs by the definition, like the real definition, mm -hmm. right? So for me, it was like this massive learning curve, like, okay, but I was like, I'm going to do it. So I put my mind to it and just, locked myself in the room or like, all right. And then like when we were in our sessions, I just absorbed everything. I talked to a bunch of people. And what's interesting is when you're in an environment, when you're the least, because you know how they say, don't be the most important person in the room. Absolutely. When you're in an environment, when you're the least important person <laughs> in the room, <laughs> then it forces you to step your game up, right? Absolutely. So I was like, just learn it. Learn, 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 learn. And I think from that process, Tim noticed, because when you're in an early stage of starting a company, you don't have real products, you don't have real customers, you're still building, you might have a, a prototype at best, right? So at that point, I think Tim really noticed that I had drive and tenacity. And he was like, all right, you know what? If nothing else, if this product doesn't work, this girl's going to get <laughs> something done, right? Absolutely. So he ended up investing in the company. And I stayed on as an advisor to Draper University. So students who had companies who were coming through the program stayed on as an advisor. We ended up getting picked up for a show on ABC Family. So I stayed on as an advisor on the show as well and kind of helped to mentor the 10 students who were competing for funding on that show and just kind of built the company in the background while I was doing all of that. And then quickly realized that, OK, I had the beginning stages, the fundamental like structure of building the company, but I didn't know management skills. I, had, I didn't know organizational skills. I didn't know like real fundamental skills and actually building a company. So I ended up reaching out to Black Enterprise because Tim and I had spoke at their conference the prior year. And I reached out to them because they were looking for a tech editor in Silicon Valley. And I was like, hey, I know tech. I have relationships. And I'm in Silicon Valley. <laughs> I'm in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so yeah, I reached out to them and I was like, hey, listen, like I'm really interested in this position. Are you guys still looking? And they were like, oh my God, yes, absolutely. So I came on board because structurally, a lot of what they were already doing at Black Enterprise is what my company needed in terms of building. So that was like a perfect marriage. And it's been a very, very cool one. All of my relationships that I've built over time, I've been able to actually plug into and like help people and get their stories out, which is ironically the same reason why I, why I started my company. So I was like, oh my gosh, like things kind of came together. So yeah, that's currently where everything is. And and, and that's one thing I, I really, you know, admire about you because just talking to you right now, you know, I can see how Tim was drawn to you because you have a very infectious personality. You have drive, you have positivity. And that's one thing uh, whenever you do your, uh, your um, uh, Instagram live, uh, for Black Enterprise, you know, ones can really, you know, pick up off of that. And, and and take me back to to when you decided you wanted to do this. 
were there any challenges that you faced? You know, being a being a young woman, being kind of green, and and being a woman of color. What were there kind of things you had to deal with? You know what's interesting? I wasn't really familiar with because I was green, which probably was like the best benefit that I could have had. I wasn't really familiar that Silicon Valley had a diversity problem. Like I did not know that <laughs> because in Draper, we're super diverse. We come from different countries, different continents. Different, like we're all over the world. So for me, it was like, oh, like this is a representation of Silicon Valley. Like I, I was in this little bubble. So like for me, I didn't know that. The challenges for me, though, were the actual company challenges. <laughs> like, how do you incorporate? How do you pay these taxes? Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you deal with accounting? So it's like basic company challenges that I was facing. Like, and 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 because Tim is who he is and has invested in tons of companies, he was able to kind of walk me through that process. But I felt like after I got to a certain point, it was like, all right, you know, like I can't really like work for your company. <laughs> like, like I'm an investor. So you got to kind of figure that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that, at that point I was like, okay, it's time to make some moves. But in terms of the diversity issue, I didn't feel like that was an issue for me because it, I wasn't exposed to it until after I kind of started breaking out and working for Black Enterprise and like going to events and understanding like what Sil Silicon Valley all actually offered. Because at that point, I was like, oh, my God, like 2%. <laughs> like, there's yeah. only X, Y, Z amount of African-Americans working at these tech companies and only 1% of venture capital went to African-American females and like all this. Stuff. And then I realized like I was one of that 1%. I was like, wait. <laughs> like, so, I mean, it, it was a shock, to be honest. No, nah, you know, and, and I and I hear you. And even even in my journey, it's like I, I started off. Um, just like as an overnight board op when I first got into, got into, got into radio and then it morphed into me being on air and everything. And then I moved into tech. And, and when, when I, when I, I basically had the same observance that you had when it comes to tech and, 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 and it's kind of shocking. And, and I was talking with, um, uh, with, uh, um, one of the representatives of the STEM program talking about STEM and, and making sure it's uh, in, in underdeveloped areas and, and how ones need to be trained you know, when it comes to it comes to technology. But one thing, again, when it comes to like startup companies and and uh, and have your own company, there's a lot of mistakes we make because we don't know where to go to. And that's why what you have done, you have opened up your mind and your experience to help ones to, to see what they need to do about startups, about venture capitalism, about all these things. And and how does that make you feel that, that you're in a position now of of being able to teach one some of the things that, that that you learned. It's interesting because it makes me realize how much I've learned because literally when I started, I was like, oh, oh anyway. <laughs> so, so it actually gives me a gauge as to how much I've grown throughout this process, but I love it. I mean, I have this theory and it's kind of morbid, but I think that you guys, I mean, <laughs> when you're, <laughs> when you, you live, right. And then you die. So like, <laughs> Why am I going to die with all of this information pent up when I know that I can expose that information and help other people get to where they need to go? And for me, that's gratifying. It's it's something that I love to do. I love connecting with people. I love helping people. That's the basis of my company, 7 a.m. Like we are a personal development education platform. So even in that route, like we are still helping people on the personal side. So for me, it's organic. Like I just why live with all this information and then take it away with you? It just doesn't make sense to me. And in, in, in your journeys of, of, of even covering different things up in Silicon Valley. And when you come across ones of color who are in the, the industry, what, what do they talk about is, is kind of being like the, uh, the number one challenge that they have to continuing to grow and to make it up the, the ladder when it comes to the tech field, especially when it comes to Silicon Valley. I think what's interesting, and maybe I have a jaded perspective because everybody who's coming to me has already a certain level of success. So I'm getting like the black entrepreneurs who have raised millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's a little bit jaded. Um, but I think that in terms of scalability, you have to have access and resources, right? And I think the one thing that I've learned within this community that I don't think was as strong in the entertainment industry, I think I, I had access to it, but 
it wasn't as strong as this community is super supportive. So it's like when you need to know something, if you need to talk to a venture capitalist, if you need to ask a specific question, if you want to talk to a founder, people are pretty transparent with what they're doing because they all that we all know that we're in the same boat. Right. So I haven't really ran into any issues where people are like, oh, my God, I'm stuck because center focus being center focused in Silicon Valley, you have so many resources. And I think the thing is, and I, I, I yelled at our Instagram, YouTube channel, our, our Instagram channel on um, a black enterprise the other day, because I'm like, you guys have YouTube. <laughs> I'm like, guys, like yep. YouTube is the video Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is no reason that you shouldn't be able to find out the questions that you have, like Google it. So I think that there is no lack of resources. And I think that if you think that there's a mental block there, right? The thing is you're lacking the resourcefulness. So if you have the ability to be curious and stay curious, then you're going to find the answers to whatever that is. So for me, again, I don't run into too many people who are like, oh, my God, I'm stuck. Because mm -hmm. I'll tell you to Google it. That's just how I feel about everything. There you go. But I mean, a lot of these accelerators out here have resources. They're giving away resources. Michael Siebel, they do office hours with Y Combinator, which is basically like the Harvard of Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, right? 500 startups, the Yale of Silicon Valley. They just did an entire hell week, like a whole week for 24 hours a day, telling you specifically how to growth hack your company. Mm. Here are specifics. Here are people who have done it. Here are people who are in the process of doing it. All the information that you need for free. All you had to do was <laughs> log on and watch the live stream. So yeah, I just don't think there's a lack of resources. It's just being resourceful and continuing to push forward. And I think one thing that it comes down to at the end of the day is when people are at that those stuck blocks, mm -hmm. It's, traditionally, it's because something isn't moving forth the way that you want it. And that normally comes down to customers, right? That's true. So if you want to raise venture capital, you can't be the woe was me person. You have to be the person that is informative and looking for information. And nine times out of 10, a venture capitalist is going to mess with you if you've grown some type of customer base, if you have some type of traction to say that this product is viable. So I think a lot of people get stuck in the mentality of, oh, I can't raise money because I'm black. No, mm. no, 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 no. <laughs> you can't raise money because you don't have a viable product. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. It's a little bit more difficult to raise money in some cases, given the, the investment thesis of that investor. So maybe they're not on the same page or maybe they, they're not aligned with what you're doing, but find people who are aligned with, with, with what you're doing and who are excited about what, what you're doing. And then let those be your advocates and your people who back you. You know, and, and Sequoia, when, when it comes to like, like, like the journey of, of creating a, a, a product, creating a company, do you think sometimes people have unreal expectations? The ones who are just starting out, not the ones who have achieved some measure of success, but the ones who are sitting at home thinking, you know, I got this nice product. I think it can change the world. Do you think that many of them fail because of unreal expectations? Yeah, I think many of them fail because, I mean, 98% of startups fail. But <laughs> yeah, that, that and that has to do with a lot of things. Like that has to do with not having the right team. That has to do with not being passionate. That has to do with not finding product market fit, not connecting to your market, your customer. That has to do, I mean, there's so many reasons why things fail, right? But I think a lot of people don't have patience. Like they don't have the patience to want to wait it out. They want things to happen instantaneously. And I think a lot of the times people think about Silicon Valley as being this like new gold rush. Like, oh, if I move there and I have this product, then I'm going to automatically generate this I'm going to raise all this money and I'm going to strike it rich. Like, nah, this ain't the gold rush. So, <laughs> so that's not, that's not the case. So I think one unrealistic expectations. Yes. But two, a lack of patience. Like it takes a little bit of time to grow a company. I, I liken it to having a child, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have a child, you, it's, you, it's an infant, right? You got to nurse it. You got to make sure it eats. You got to make sure it, it, you can't leave it, it'll die. Like there's so many things you got to make sure happen, right? So as it starts to grow, you can start to step away a little bit more, but like in its infancy, you better be there paying attention. 
So I think that that is a, a big reason why a lot of these companies fail is because of the, the expectations, yes, are unrealistic, but also not having that patience. And, and how important is, is branding, Sequoia, when it comes to starting out? Did you say branding? Yes. Yeah, I think branding is important down the line. Like, I think you have to at least figure out what the product is and, and if it's connecting to the market, right? So, for example, what we do with Draper University students or entrepreneurs who come through the program is like, you got to validate the product. So we'll give you like, I don't know, a survey that says, OK, are you interested? So let's say your product is like cat litter that changes colors. It's actually was <laughs> on our show. So are people who are cat lovers interested in seeing their cat litter change colors? Like. You have to ask very specific questions, you know, to understand if your market is even like if that's a viable product for your market. Right. So once you ask those specific questions, and you start to validate it. Then you have to figure out, OK, are these people going to pay for it? Right. So what you do is you start to put up price points like, OK, if we had a pre-sale, would you guys buy this for $19.99? Would you buy it for $10.99? Like, would you spend your money, right? And that happens before you get to brand. You need to know all that stuff beforehand because what you don't want to do is build this beautiful product that's that's brand worthy and looks amazing and, and feels great. And everybody who looks at it and tries it is like, hey, I'm good. So then you've wasted all this time, you've wasted all this money, and it's crickets around your products, right? So build out the concept first, validate that concept. Once that concept is validated, then start to build around the brand and structure the brand. You know, as I listen to you right now, I'm just like mesmerized because coming from a green area you were when you started out to where you're <laughs> out right now, I mean, you're like, I'm like, girl, you bad. You know that? Oh, you got skills. <laughs> I'm like, goodness. I mean, this is, this is pretty cool. So so when it comes to, I guess, any other advice you can give out there to ones out there who are who are want to go down this road, what kind of advice would you give them? I would say understand that building a business is not for you, right? Like you might be passionate as all heaven about your product. You might be super excited. You might be like, I would use this <laughs> 10 times over, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean everybody else is. So you got to stop thinking about you when you're building a product and you have to start thinking about your customer. Is your customer going to be excited about this? Is your customer going to use this? Because at the end of the day, it ain't about you. It's about Absolutely. your customer. So make sure that you are paying attention fully to your customer. You know, it kind of reminds me of, you know, growing up, you know, we always had a relative or it could have been us. Who you know? Who thought we can sing? And our parents like, girl, you sound good. Or boy, you sound good. You should sing. And couldn't sing a lick. You know. Sometimes that happens. And when it comes to businesses, family and friends are like, oh, this would be a good product. This would be a good product. That's why you have to talk to the professionals out there, like Sequoia. Yeah, you, you know, have to, find to go to. You have to go outside of your immediate family, your immediate circle, because they love you. So they're gonna caress you, and they're gonna be like, oh, that's so great. <laughs> you have to go to the customer who does not know you from a can of worms and is like, all right, would you use this product? And if they're like, no, repeatedly, you might want to find something else. Absolutely. And Sequoia, what about focus groups? You know, how, how early on should you use focus groups when it comes to a product? You do it early on or should you do it after you've done your homework a little bit and built up a, a little, I guess, track record of what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I think that you should use focus groups as soon as possible. I think that they're another way of validation, right? So if you are out in the market and you go to maybe a website, a blog who relates directly to your product, use them as a focus group. Figure out if that's something that they would want to use or if that's something that they connect to because you need as much feedback in the beginning stages as possible. You, like you get that feedback, you iterate, you pivot based off of that feedback and you constantly, constantly change and evolve the product based around that feedback. So however you need to get that feedback, that's what you need to be doing. Like that is literally the beginning stages of building your product. And Sequoia, I had an opportunity to talk to an artist one day because I was asking him about, you know, how do he knows if he write if he's writing a book, how do we know that it's something that's going to be a hit? And this is what he said. Let me know if you if you agree with it or not. And I think yeah. this principle kind of applies to everything. He said it's kind of like um, a, a symphony. Like if everybody is 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 giving you the the same constructive criticism and it's sounding melodious, you kind of want to listen to it. Then just yeah. 
one person is like, wah, 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 wah. is that is that the same principle you can uh, use here too? Yeah, because everybody's going to have a different perspective. But if that perspective keeps coming up over and over and over again, you got to change something because that means across the board, people are not connecting for whatever reason. So yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Like, make sure you listen to perspectives that are across the board because I might not personally like your product just because I personally don't like it. But just because I don't like it doesn't mean somebody perspective. Awesome. Sequoia, it's been an honor talking to you, my dear. Before we let you go, anything else you'd like to articulate out there to the audience? Uh, that you like to uh, like to speak about. Yeah, don't be afraid. Just get out there and do it. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, get out there and do it. If it's a beautiful, perfected product, that means you've launched too late. Make sure you get it out to the market, broken and all, and let the market decide what direction that they want that product to go into. Words of wisdom. And I know everybody's like, how can I get in contact with Sequoia? How can I get in contact with her? So Sequoia, the, the $35 million question, how can ones get in contact with you and find out more information? Even also check out some of the great articles that, that you have uh, written for uh, Black Enterprise. Yeah, so I definitely have a Black Enterprise author page. So if you search my name, Sequoia Blodgett on Black Enterprise, all of my articles will come up. I'm in every single piece of social media that exists on the planet. So if you go to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you can hit me on pretty much any of them. I am on Twitter the most, I would say. So Twitter is probably the best. And that is at Sequoia B, S-E-Q-U-I-O-I-A B. Um, but I'm on all of them, Instagram included. So yeah. Awesome. So what? Sequoia, it's been an honor talking to you, just hearing your story and and see where you're at today and see where you continue to go. I think in like five years, you're going you're gonna to be like just at the top of the game. But don't forget us little people, okay? <laughs> That's the hope. <laughs> awesome. Well, Sequoia, great talking to you, my dear. Thank you. What did I tell you? Sequoia Blodgett. Awesome. Awesome individual. Very bright mind. And, and think about it, folks. When she started, she started off green. Now, for some of you out there who have no idea what it means starting off green, I mean, she had, didn't have a lot of experience. And look at her now. I mean, she's spewing off facts and all the great stuff. Follow her. Connect with her. She is simply amazing. Hey, when we get back on the tech zone, have you ever thought about, is it hard to keep up with medications out there? Maybe you have a grandmother aging parents out there and you worry about them and their medication to make sure that they are taking their medication well, what if I told you that there's a company out there that is instituting and marrying artificial intelligence when it comes to medication you don't want to miss that coming up Tech Zone Paul Amadeus Lane in the words of Chuck Woolery we'll be back in two and two